Okay, yeah. Uh, the session is now recording. I'll turn on my camera. Uh, hi, uh, hello everyone. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, uh, just a bit of an introduction. I am um, Abhijit Morya. I am a student at the National Law University of Delhi, second year. And uh, yeah, today I'll be talking about talking, taking you through some basic concepts vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis the philosophy of law. Now, I sent you, uh, I think, a list of uh, basic ideas and traditions that we'll be traversing through, uh, which includes natural law theory, legal positivism, common law tradition, legal interpretivism, and critical and postmodern approaches. So um, we'll, 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 we'll be going back and forth. We'll not be, uh, you know, just picking one um, tradition and examining it through its then, but we'll be going back and forth, back and forth as, you know, uh, in, a, in a chronological order in the sense that how, uh, you know, these theories have developed over time and how you know, the way we looked at it has changed uh, over these years. So, um, yeah, that is basically the perspective that we are going to take. And, uh, yeah, uh, I, I, I will, let's start now. Um, so, before we begin, I, I'd like to take you through the very the basic idea of what law is or, you know, why do we need to um, basically try to understand and why, why is it important to understand what law is? So, um, humans, um, like other animals, have this ability to um, look into the future as in to understand how to, you know, they have the ability to understand how future is going to be and they want to uh, live life in a manner that is sustainable, you know, so that they don't die very easily and, you know, are able. And that is why many animals, you know, uh, just uh, arrange themselves into communities. And humans have this ability, I think, uh, I mean, you know, there are like, of course, you know, discussions in empirical sciences about it, but uh, humans have this ability to the largest extent in, in the manner that we can ideate a future that is not just our immediate future uh, and, you know, that is, uh, that is a future that, you know, spans, um, you know, uh, much into the, uh, we have an idea about how things are going to be after us. And, you know, we want, uh, you know, certain, our, our offsprings to, you know, live in a certain way and, you know, uh, communicate with each other in certain ways. And that is why, uh, and that is why, you know, we, we feel this, uh, humans have this uh, propensity to organize them into big, big communities and civilizations, et cetera, et cetera. Now, um, with this ability to look into the future also comes an ability to, um, uh, to uh, ability to abstract concepts, right? For example, today I see a whiteboard, I see a white uh, a chalk, I see uh, a white floor. And, you know, I have, I have this ability to abstract the idea of whiteness from, uh, from you know, seeing all various manifestations of this idea of something being white and and as as humans we we we, we do that and whenever the next time we see that there is something white we can correlate it to oh you know uh, there is something that, that i saw white yesterday so there is this idea of whiteness in my head that i can correlate to it so in a way that we can abstract properties is something uh, that is also a, a, you know a property that humans possess um, yeah, so going back to our, uh, uh, you know, roots as, uh, you know, we began as hunter-gatherers, right? We used to, uh, you know, organize ourselves into small groups because we found that it is a more sustainable way to survive, right? Uh, in, in the early days when, you know, every day used to be, you know, day we used to go, you know, basically gather stuff, hunt something and, you know, get food for ourselves, there was not... Uh, like a very elaborate need for, uh, you know, social use because, you know, everyone just, thought, you know, just uh, lived hand to mouth, right? I mean, there was no as such social rules except for the basic rules that, oh, you know, we should not harm each other, right? So there was this basic rule and, you know, we should basically live together in a way that is conducive to our uh, coexistence, right? So, um, uh, but, you know, as we, you know, settled in agricultural societies, as, you know, we used to, uh, stored food we started you know producing in bulk what happened was that there was uh, a need fell that you know that this this uh, system of rules uh, that we are uh, now that we are organizing ourselves in in in, in bigger community these systems of norm should be uh, you know should uh, started taking more of a formal shape right 
so now you know we had laws relating to how okay you know we are engaging in agriculture together how will the produce of this agriculture be you know distributed and how must we you know conduct ourselves in in, in relation to our various tasks right so uh, we we see here like organically from society developing a system of norms right um legal philosopher h l a hart calls these the primary rules right and this is uh, contrasted to something called the secondary rules which are rules uh, uh, that are supposed to enforce these norms right now in smaller communities you know when things can be uh, done on the basis of consensus we do not feel this need to uh, basically uh, you know to to have an formal enforcing mechanism in place right uh, things just you know work organically on trust right but when we have larger societies there is a need to of course to have an enforcing mechanism you know a, a basically a, you know maybe a third you know maybe a, a third party which looks over and you know passes decisions okay you know you did something wrong okay you know one person killed another person what should happen to that person i mean you know so 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 and so forth so we have these systems of norms emerging that are not only related to uh, uh related to uh how we should conduct ourselves but also about what we should do in cases that there is a breach of these norms right so there is this system of norms that is developing that we can abstract in the sense and call them and you know address them together as law right the same way that we did with whiteness you know there is the concept of whiteness which is abstracted uh from its origins and you know we we say that oh there is a absolute concept of whiteness that you know that is individual of indi- uh, individual instances of whiteness right same we have something a body of you know a, a, a body of things as a concept of law emerging uh which is independent of how you know these rules may be manifested in themselves so here we have a concept of law that has emerged uh i mean you know that i mean this is not the only way that i i but i done is that given you a prototype of how uh, a system of norms can develop um, uh, um into something like a law right so uh i'll 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 address as to what you know uh, i'll i'll go as to a basic understanding of what law is and what is it that we are doing uh, when we are doing the philosophy of law right when we think of law we think of it as something that is at least in today's society we think of them as something that are different from plain morality or ethics right so in a sense law is more uh, um, you know it is something that is different from ethics and society but you know i mean we do not have exactly uh, we do not know exactly how it is different and you know we see how we will see how different traditions have you know tried to answer these questions in different manner how is law separate from ethics even if there is a law if there's a, there's a separation between law and ethics that is also a contested idea right um and uh, uh, so uh, I, i'll just uh, go over uh, you know some ideas of uh, legal philosophy i mean you know a legal philosophy as a discipline uh, has basically two facets right uh, one is one is something that we call i mean you know uh, yeah and i'll explain some basic terms regarding legal philosophy i think you know many people confuse what exactly jurisprudence means right some you know sometimes we see jurisprudence being used interchangeably with legal philosophy and sometimes we see it used in another in another context right um so i'll just clarify that uh, jurisprudence when we talk about them as a system of laws uh, can be can may, can mean a different thing than we're talking about it in context of legal philosophy right for example we can say that um, the right to equality jurisprudence in india is such an is so and so so what do we mean by use the use of the word jurisprudence there is different uh, it, it does not mean legal philosophy but rather a system of you know case laws and you know basically a, a system of cases and precedents that that you know give us a clear picture of what the law is on a particular case so that is different we can have a jurisprudence on medical law we can have a jurisprudence on tort law which is different from you know when we use the word jurisprudence in context of legal philosophy when we use it in context of legal philosophy most scholars use it interchangeably as you know there's no difference between uh, legal uh, legal philosophy and jurisprudence right so um yeah so the the discipline of legal philosophy of jurisprudence has two facets uh first we have the analytic jurisprudence and secondly we have the normative jurisprudence now what is the difference between these two 
when we're talking about analytic jurisprudence we we basically are trying to examine what um what the, what law basically is what is the nature of law or you know what what are the properties that law has so basically we're trying to grapple with the idea of law as to what law is so that is what constitutes of analytical jurisprudence normative jurisprudence on the other hand uh, you know deals with the ideas that uh, that are that are more particular in the sense that what you know they deal with legal norms as you know what should we do you know be, given that we have such and such idea of what law is for example uh, a question that you know should can law punish for uh, can law punish an individual with capital punishment right this is uh, this is a question that that is in the realm of normative jurisprudence it deals with what we can do given you know our idea and understanding of the law um you know we can have a question you know of normative jurisprudence uh, which deals with um how should law deal with equality right i mean you know what concept of equality should should law adopt that is an idea of normative jurisprudence because it deals with you know norms of law rather than you know what law actually is as a metaphysical uh, thing right i mean as a metaphys metaphysical concept so um uh, the this like this series of lectures will mostly be dealing with analytical jurisprudence rather than normative jurisprudence because normative jurisprudence only and the question of normative jurisprudence only arise when we have an analytical framework uh, within our grasp uh, to deal with these questions with um yeah so the 20, the history of legal philosophy especially in the 20th century has largely been looked as a debate between natural law and uh, and legal positivism uh, before we begin and you know try to analyze various ideas about um, you know these various theories of law we we'll, i'll just quickly explain these two brief terms because they'll be a key to our understanding of other concepts as well right so natural law is basically the idea that law is not created by a person or a culture but it is something that that you know has an existence that is independent of our individual or collective will right uh, there can be i mean there are various schools of uh, um, you know um, of natural law i think the most basic distinction that we can draw between uh, these two ideas of natural between two ideas of natural law will be a theological natural law and a non theological natural law so a theological uh, school of schools of natural law they basically try to gra ground natural law into a, 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 you know into a relationship with the divine right as in there is a law that you know principle basic of ethics that has been laid down by god and you know our human law you know the the way that we operate law should be derived from that so uh, an influential thinker in theological you know schools of natural law will be st thomas aquinas st thomas aquinas said that there is something like an eternal law which is you know the law that you know that is god's plan uh, god's plan for the world and from there is a part of this eternal law which is rationally knowable by human beings this is what he calls the natural law right and uh, and our human law should actually it should what it should do is to use these principles of natural law in 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 you know to to basically shape our, our human law so for st thomas aquinas a human law is valid or you know it, it is uh, law in so far as it corresponds with this natural law and you know this uh, which is derived from this eternal law right uh, and in so far as it, it, it as it digresses from it it is not uh, you know law at all right so this is a theological idea of natural law uh, a, a non theological uh, you know idea of natural law we can for, for that we can look into the ideas of modern uh, natural lawyers like lon funer and john finnis right the I'll, i'll give an example of a non theological uh, you know how we can conceive of natural law as a, as a non theological entity lon fuller a uh, legal philosopher uh, he basically talked about natural law as you know emerging from a set of ideas that are fundamental to our notion of law itself right for example uh, he says that you know law is something that is addressed to rational human beings to guide their conduct right now now with this idea that you know law is something that is uh, with this idea that law is something that is supposed to guide a uh, human conduct we have uh, we have certain notions that are emerging about law itself right uh, for example there you know we'll have this idea that uh, law 
is supposed to, I mean, you know, law cannot, we cannot have secret laws, right? Because if law is supposed to address rational human beings to guide their conduct, how can we have something like a secret law? Secret law is basically, you know, something that, you know, a government passes, which is only known to that government and, you know, and it can punish other individuals on basis of that law. For example, Nazi Germany had many secret laws, right? These laws were known only to the the the, the upper echelons of, of of party hierarchy, and they used to randomly punish people who used to, you know, uh, who, who used to uh, violate these uh, secret laws. So uh, Fuller says that these secret laws are not laws at all, because if you do not tell people that you know these are the laws, how can you expect them to um, you know obey them? So this is an idea of natural law. I mean, you know, it is grounding the idea of natural law into something that is, uh, you know, natural or, you know, a metaphysical idea of law that is just there, right? So uh, another example, maybe that there can be no, re there can be no retrospective laws, right? For example, you cannot pass a law today and say that it will apply to instances that happen tomorrow as well, right? For example, I can say, you know, I mean, you know, walking in a park is legal today and I've been walking in park um, you know, for, for my entire life, right? Walking in the park outside my house. Now, a law is passed that walking in this particular park is now illegal, right? Now, if it, if it is uh, prospective, I can say, okay, you know, now this law has come into being, I can regulate my behavior accordingly and not go to the park, you know, from today. But if it says that this is, this is active retrospectively, what it does is that it criminalizes my act of walking in the park in, in the past as well. And now we have basically, you know, uh, like a government that is punishing me uh, for an act which I did not know was illegal. So it, it betrays the idea that law is something that is uh, addressed to rational individuals to guide their conduct. So this is not law at all. This is what, you know, a natural lawyer like Lauren Fuller would say. So this is basically, uh, I've given you a, a brief picture of natural law. We'll come into, we'll go to natural law, uh, you know, in much detail uh, after this. Uh, and, you know, I, I like to introduce you to the second, uh, you know, very influential idea of law that is, legal positivism now uh, before we go into what legal positivism is i think we should understand what the term positivism implies in philosophy right uh, the modern founder of positivism in the sense was uh, august comte uh, he was a, a you know sociologist who basically advocated for positivism uh, in in social sciences so uh, what uh, what uh, August Comte thought is that knowledge is basically, you know, derived, the, the, the development of human knowledge takes place in three steps. The first step he calls the theological state, where phenomena are produced to be derived from a supernatural entity, right? That is what he calls the theological state. The second is the metaphysical state, where abstract ideas or, you know, single all encompassing ideas like nature or, or you know whatever are substituted for these supernatural entities right so instead of having something like you know god giving you meaning you have these abstract uh, ideas about what the nature of you know nature of the world is or your know, nature of human being is that is giving you uh, uh, you know some ideas about uh, uh, you know human knowledge the third stage he he calls it the positive state where laws of laws of knowledge and existence are derived through close observation of all the positive phenomena that is all the facts that is that are occurring that all the empirically obs uh, you know observable uh, phenomena that is occurring you derive your uh, you know knowledge on basis of that right so um, this is what Paul, you know august comte's idea of positivism was so if i have to state you know what positivism is in in in, a, in one sentence it will probably be that uh, it is uh, for positivism the meaningfulness of a statement or a of an assertion de is is dependent on two ideas right it is dependent on two conditions first it is it either has to be empirically verifiable as it you know i can go and see and you know basically confirm whether this is true or not uh, or it can be rationally understandable, right? Which you know I can rationally you know you know conclude or deduce that this this uh, this claim is true. Uh, for a positivist, if if an if an assertion is neither empirically verifiable or uh, or it is uh, you know rationally knowable, that that falls under the realm of. Um, that falls under the realm of metaphysics now and you know and 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 positivists use the term metaphysics almost in a derogatory manner right 
So, I mean, you know, positivism has a long um, origin story. You know, you go back to August Comte, you, and, you know, then we have movements of new positivism with, uh, you know, Ludwig Wittgenstein. We had the Vienna Circle. We'll not go into, uh, you know, a, a very elaborate history of what positivism is. We'll, we'll stay, uh, we'll stay, our, uh, we'll, we'll ground our understanding of positivism and, you know, into as to what, uh, you know, legal positivism is, right? So, um, so whereas you know we can say that a positive social a positivist sociology looks at facts and empirical data and social facts you know as the basis of their knowledge uh, a non positivist sociology we can say you know for example the interpretivist uh, sociology of weber takes qualitative uh, you know qualitative information about uh, about societies like you know motives of people consciousness beliefs and ideas of social actors into consideration while it is you know evolving its its, its sociological theories right now uh, legal positive is, uh, you know this is like what positivism means in social sciences mostly right but when we're talking about uh, legal positivism uh, you know uh, legal positivism as a theory of law what we are talking about basically is it's different from scientific and sociological positivism because it's it's not so much about a, a methodology of doing law but it speaks to more about the origins of law right what do we mean about that so legal positivism says that law is rather than you know being uh, something that is grounded in god or something is grounded in the metaphysical notions of law it is something that is grounded in in human facts about law you know social facts about law so uh, the idea of of positivism as a legal philosophy holds that law is something that is posited by you know posited by humans that is created by people it does not have a metaphysical or natural origin yeah sorry uh, so there are two features of legal positivism firstly there is the pedigree rule it is the notion that you know the law law is something that is created by human beings and it is a part of society it is a part of society and does not transcend it right uh, and it is possible to tell whether something is law or not by asking whether it has been created uh, within a framework of rules specified by uh, society for the establishment of law you know for example uh, we can say you know in, in india you know anything is law which you know anything that parliament passes is the law right it is an instance of positive law what is what is what what does parliament do you know it sits around uh, and you know discusses laws and then it votes on something and then you know magically something becomes law right so what is happening here is that there is no then they're not consulting some idea of human nature and you know they're trying to divide they're, they're trying to derive their law from it what they're basically doing is 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 you know engaging in a human activity which is giving rise to something like like law right so so this is called the pedigree rule as in you know we we look to basically to know what law is we do not engage in any sort of metaphysical um, you know ideation about what law is we just look at the pedigree where is it coming from is it coming from an institution that has the valid authority to make laws or is it you know not coming from that, uh, that. so basically uh, what what is it that separates you know law you know parliament makes a law and says that oh you know you have to follow it or you know uh, or you will be punished right you have, there's a rule you either follow it or you'll be punished right how is it different from you know let's say a a a a a robber that comes from behind you creeps from behind you puts a gun into onto your head and basically says you either give me your money or you know or or i'll shoot you so you know it's saying doing the same thing it's saying that you engage in a certain sort of behavior if no, you're not engaging in so, this sort of behavior um i will uh, you know in, impose some harm upon you which is like you know so 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 HLA Hart, you know, the one of the most influential philosophers of uh, 20th century, which we'll discuss uh, later, he engaged in this question as to what um you know it, it is that basically this separates law from you know any other uh, you know threats uh, you know and I mean you know many philosophers even like uh, as early as like John Austin, we'll talk about him as well. Positivist philosopher also engaged in this uh, discussion about uh, you know law in, in that regard. So um, so yeah, so this is uh, yeah this, this is the separation thesis. The second uh, thesis of law. Is, uh, so this is sorry, this is the pedigree rule, right? Uh, the second feature of positivism is the separation thesis. Uh, 
as in that there uh, that positivism uh, positivism implies that there is a necessary uh, you know that, that that law does not have a necessary connection between law and that there's that, that you know there's no necessary connection between law and morality right so because it is something that is posited by humans it can be moral it can be immoral but it does not matter you know uh, when we're talking about uh, identification of law as in you know whether this is law whether it is law or not it is it does not matter whether you know that law is moral or immoral right which is something that is opposed to natural law natural law you know grants that there, there is a universal law and you know and there is a system of you know moral system that is you know ubiquitous and from there we have to derive a human law so but in this is not what uh, that this is not what uh, positivism is saying positivism is saying is that law can be moral and moral that does not mat that does not you know change the fact that it is law right so there is no necessary connect so some people take it to mean that there is no connection between law and morality but it is it is inaccurate to say that there is no connection between law and morality of course there is connection between law and morality because you know we assess the value of law by you know judging whether it is moral or not what legal positive is just saying is that it does not matter whether uh, you know in identification of law in 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 assessing whether law is law or not it does not matter you know whether the law is moral or not so law should not be identified with morality is is what positivists are saying uh so yeah this is like a basic introduction to um you know uh what these basic ideas are i i'll, I'll go into them as we discuss them uh so yeah so after that what we'll do is that we go into various theories of uh, you know uh law we'll start with natural law and we'll go into the common law tradition after that we'll go into positivism and interpretivism and and you know and finally we'll we'll be ending with a, a look at critical theory and postmodern approaches to law um so uh, before i go into any specific theory i'd, yeah, I'd, I'd like to um, you know take a short break uh, you know for any questions that anyone may have regarding any ideas or uh, or any 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 sort of comments clarification of any sort if you if you if any of you have Hi, Abhinit. Um, I had a question. So, the for the legal positivists, the identification of law as law does not require a connection with morality. Uh, then, what is the the selection criteria for something to be considered law for a legal positivist? Yeah, I mean, for sele uh, for uh, the selection criteria, is simple. It is based on some facet of um, of uh, human conduct. Uh, right so i mean different philosophers have you know given different answers as to what you know what sort of you know social behavior should constitute law for example austin you know one of the founders of legal positivism thought that you know law is something that is uh, that is addressed from a political superior to political inferior right the basic idea that law is the command of the sovereign whatever you know the sovereign or you know wants you know that becomes law I mean, it does not matter whether the sovereign is one king or a, a parliament of people right so this is basically the criteria for identification of law it is its pedigree uh, and it pos and no 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 positivist says that you know that that law should not be moral of course it should be moral but just that that this that that morality should not go into the consideration of 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 you know what law uh, of of whether uh, you know a norm is law or not uh, it should be based on some human activity right which which sort of uh, some which can be political activity or whatever which which you know results in something like law uh, and we will go into detail about it when we discuss various uh, theories of positivism uh, but yeah I, I, does that answer your question asa yes yes absolutely thank you okay okay yeah um so um do we have any more questions clarifications or should we just go into uh, natural law okay then um since there are um, no um comments questions or whatever um i'll i'll go into um you know natural law so um and you know throughout these uh, when i'm explaining all these theories i'll be uh, heavily quoting uh, primary texts and you know uh, the texts written by these various philosophers themselves and i'm doing that in order to you know to to just uh, this talk uh 
just to maintain my fidelity to the source material. I, I mean, I'm not by no means I'm an expert in in whatever I'm talking about. I'm just a student. I'm, I, I've I've not even graduated uh, law school yet, so I'm, I'm by no means I'm I'm a, an expert in any of these things. But it's just uh, my interest and you know, that I keep studying about these things. So uh, you know, I'll be quoting source material heavily so that you know um I, I, so that my uh, my so that you know uh, my fidelity to the source material is maintained and I'm not you know going. Too bit too far astray from what these philosophers have been saying, just to ease down uh, our understanding of it. Um, and I hope you bear me through it. Um, so uh, let's go into natural law. Um, so as I said, um, natural law is the idea that law is something that is law is not something that is created by a personal culture, but has existence that is independent of individual or collective will of humans. Right. Um, before we go into um, various theories about uh, Natural law. I'll draw your attention to this uh, play uh, of Sophocles called Antigone. Uh, within when we consider considering um, you know legal education and whenever we are being taught uh, natural law, I think this is the first um, instances that we are uh, you know introduced with where where you know sort of natural law came you know where purportedly natural law came in conflict with human laws, right? As in you know. As in, where we should ground our understanding of law, you know, and it, it is a staple of basically every uh, law and literature course in in in, in every uh, in every law school. You know, we're we're all taught Antigone to you know basically ground and to, to basically you know just look at um uh, how the, the how the earliest ideas of natural law were conceived. So um, I'll give you the story outline of Antigone. Uh, so Antigone is, uh, you know, Sophocles' play. It is sort of a sequel, in a manner, it's a sequel of Oedipus, the play Oedipus Rex. Uh, you know, uh, after it, it takes place after Oedipus. You know, Oedipus and Jocasta married. They had four kids: uh, Polynices, Eteocles, um, Ismene, and Antigone. Uh, Polynices and uh, Eteocles are the sons, and Ismene and Antigone are the daughters. Right. So what happens after Oedipus, uh, after the death of Oedipus, uh, you know, there is a civil war that is happening in the city of Thebes for the throne of Thebes now that, you know, Oedipus Rex is no longer the king, right? So uh, what happens is that Eteocles and Polynices, you know, they engage in a battle and both of these brothers die while fighting for the throne, right? So now since Oedipus does not have any direct male heir, uh, a male heir what happens is, uh, you know, Jocasta's brother, uh, Creon becomes the ruler of of uh, ruler of the uh, Agneet. I am not able to hear you. All of a sudden, is anyone else having this problem? Um, same here. Right, let's uh, give it a moment. Avineet, can you hear me? I just texted Abhinit, he might be having some signal issue. So let's just wait for him to rejoin.
Hello, sorry. Uh, am I audible now? Yeah, all good. Okay, okay. I'm so sorry for that. Uh, till where, till where did you hear me? What was the last thing? Um, about Antigone and and the the uncle becomes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. So, um, so yeah. Uh, so af you know now that Itocles and Polynices are dead, uh, you know Jocasta's brother, uh, that is their uncle. uh now he becomes the king of thebes right so now he issues a decree that the etocles will be you know buried with a whole with a whole set of religious honors and rights uh but the invading brother that is polynices he will be um you know dishonored and he'll be left in the battlefield to rot which is an ignominious end as per the religious laws of uh, i mean you know of of that of that place right so what happens is that uh, now you know antigone uh, you know the sister what she does is that she she talks to ismene and you know she wants to uh, basically give them a, give polynices a proper burial right uh, but ismene refuses to uh, you know disobey the decree of the of the ruler of thebes and you know she did not want to come in 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 uh to in conflict with the law you know that was a positive law that was laid by the uh, uh, by the king of thebes but now uh, what happens is that uh, antigone on the other hand she goes and you know gives uh, gives the, she she buries the body herself and uh, creon you know of course creon was not happy about the fact that you know his decree was disobeyed and you know she uh, he confronts antigone for uh, for disobeying the law to which uh, antigone says and i and i and i quote uh, that order did not come from god justice that dwells with the gods knows no such law i did not think that your edict strong enough to overrule the unwritten unalterable laws of gods and heavens you being only a man they are not of yesterday or today but everlasting though where they came from none of us can tell guilty of the transgression before god i cannot be for any man on earth so what what uh, what uh, antigone is trying to tell us that there is uh, there is you know on the veneer of this entire human law there is something like a deeper law of you know law of the underworld which you know which which prohibits her from you know basically you know transgressing itself and you know and she she would rather transgress a human law than you know being transgression of this uh, eternal law or you know the law of the underworld or the religious law so um uh so this uh, entire uh, uh, the story tells us that you know it can be read in many ways and you know over the years scholars have interpreted it in many ways you know some look at it as a conflict between natural law and positive law some look at it as it as a plainly uh, a sort of a conflict between private law and public law as in, you know public law passed by uh, passed by A, a sovereign, you know, to for the conduct of public relations and private law, you know, laws relating to family, laws relating to religion, right? So it is a conflict between them. Uh, German philosopher uh, G. W. F. Hegel, uh, in his philosophy of right, uh, you know, read Antigone as a dialectic between, uh, you know, the law of man and the law of woman, right? And and he writes in the philosophy of right, man has his actual substantive life in the state, in learning, and so forth. as well as in labor and struggle with the external world and with himself woman on the other hand has a substantive destiny in the family and to be imbued with family piety is an ethical frame of mind again i mean you know um, what 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 you know, people, the ways that people have read antigone you know in various contexts over time uh, and it has certainly been evolved it, it has certainly evolved over time the way that we look at antigone but yeah at the at the root of it it's it sort of you know presents us a conflict between uh, something that is uh, you know a, a law that is posited and a law that exists independent of you know it being posited this is a very interesting study uh, and you know whenever we thinking of uh, natural law we we always think of antigone as as a, as a example of you know where uh, of where the, for the idea of natural law first you know was was put forward uh, and so on uh, and natural law of course had 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 a tradition in jo- in in roman law which was very uh, which was very deeply ingrained um, roman statesman cicero uh, you know talks about natural law as 
as a right she defines natural law as right reason in agreement with nature so what basically uh, what basically for cicero law is uh, like natural law is that it is a natural law that is create that is uh, uh, that is superior to the law that is created by state it is universal and it applies to everyone you know doesn't matter whether you are in rome or athens it is unchanging and it is eternal right and lastly it is a law that can be found within us right we do not look outside ourselves for an interpreter of natural law uh, we only need to look within ourselves and our own natural reason to basically to know what natural law is is what you know these uh, yeah, what cicero is arguing you no know? and this goes in direct conflict with our understanding of law as you know modern uh, individuals who live you know where where you know, positive law is the strongest tradition that exists right where we see law as you know something that is external to us something that is applied to us from the outside right uh, but here cicero is uh, you know uh, cicero is giving us uh, an idea of law that emerges not from something that is outside um, you know humans but something that is that you know this comes from within us from our natural reason from the faculties that are within us uh, you know this is the cicero's idea of natural law that deeply influenced the the way you know natural law was conceived in 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 in, in rome right so this was called jus natural uh, in 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 latin right which is which is which was an important part of uh, you know our legal tradition and many of uh, of the way that you know we think about law today especially in the civil law tradition i'll come to what you know civil law and common law distinction uh, after that uh, you know it is the roman law holds a very special importance and you know, their ideas of law right uh, so another aspect of cicero's reasoning cicero's idea about natural law is of course law is Uh, you know law, the law arises from something like a natural reason that is imbued within us you know uh, like you know we, we normally think and you know we can arrive at law now this is something that is at direct contrast with the way the idea of when we think about legal reasoning right we say stuff like uh, you know we should think like a lawyer i mean you know what does that imply it implies that you know the way that lawyers think or the way that we engage in legal reasoning is different from uh you know natural reasoning or something like you know we may engage uh you know uh, normally right so uh, this entire idea of the distinction between a natural reason and artificial reason will come again when we are discussing the common law the philosophy of common law and common law tradition right uh, which which was basically you know what was what was the law in 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 medieval england and you know and you know towards uh, you know 15th 16th 17th century it was Uh, how law was perceived right uh, so i uh, yeah, will come to that after we done with our discussion on natural law um so one of the uh, you know earliest theorists of natural law at least uh, you know uh, the way that we look at it today uh, was aristotle um aristotle talks about uh, you know aristotle talks of course you, you know when in his the politics he talks about man uh he she says that man by nature is a political animal right um and what does that mean we need to unpack it right uh so i'll explain it through some of the very basic ideas of aristotle you know two main ideas uh, which is his theory of four causes and his theory of essentialism right so the theory of four causes state that every phenomena every object everything that exists has four causes uh one is the material cause what it is made of second is the formal cause what is the structure of that thing third is the efficient cause what brought it into existence and for last is the final cause or what is the you know purpose of its existence right so um, so for example if we look at a chair its material cause is wood you know it is made of wood its formal cause is the shape of a chair you know if if a chair is not shaped like a chair you know you cannot sit on it right i mean you know so 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 the formal cause is is a part of its identity uh then the efficient cause will be the carpenter who made uh that uh, that chair into what it is i mean not just the carpenter the wood cutter you know which chopped the wood the carpenter which shaped the wood you know all all these will be part of the efficient cause of that chair and the final cause of the chair which is you know understood to be its purpose would be um uh would be 
it's the fact that you know we want to sit on chair that you know human beings need something to sit on so that is the final cause because we make it what is the final end of that thing to so that we can sit on it right so um so for aristotle the the, the central point of uh, you know anything you know the way that anything is conceived is through its final cause it is because something has a final cause that you know it, it shapes all its cause right all its other three causes for example it is the fact that we need to uh, you know we need something to sit on you know that is why we choose wood for the chair right otherwise we could choose something like i don't know stone or something hard which will be uncomfortable to us uh, right and why we choose the shape of a chair you know the shape of a chair because it is comfortable for us to you know to sit on so in a way everything is uh, every all the other causes of a chair is guided by its final cause you know the fact that we have to sit on it so this is a part of aristotle's teleology right uh, the the idea that everything is guided towards you know its its ends right so uh, aristotle gives this idea that you know everything in everything in the world is you know uh, arranged as per as per their 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 ends right for example we have teeth because we need to chew things right uh, camels have humps because they travel in 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 deserts and you know for long hours and in for long many many days without you know going for water that is why they have humps so aristotle noticed in nature that there is this very uh, it is all together fitting like a jigsaw puzzle of ends right uh, i mean you know uh so 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 uh, you know flowers are colorful bees are attracted towards colorful things and you know flowers need bees to transport pollen you know so that they can propagate so all these these ideas that you know aristotle observed was basically leading up to the fact that you know that there is a sort of a teleology associated with nature and secondly his idea of essentialism which is that the essence of a thing is something that defines it right so now the essence of the thing is dependent on you know it's 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 teleology to a certain extent for uh, for um, uh, for uh, for aristotle right so something is that thing and not any other thing is because of its essence right it is something so for aristotle like the essence of some the essence of something is two things first uh, that without that thing that would not be that thing right so for example if we take out from the uh, the chair the fact that we cannot sit on it it will no longer be a chair right so it is uh, so it is without without the fact that we can sit on it a chair is not a chair and uh, it is the and secondly it is the best description of that thing is is you know what what basically defines it so so this is basically the idea of essentialism that aristotle propounded uh, and uh, uh it is given a brief idea i have not gone into the details but you know for our definition uh, that you know that man so for, for example the essence of man for aristotle its definition is that man is uh, by nature uh, a social or political animal right so the teleology of human beings is to associate with each other in political and social ways right and aristotle very famously says that a man who doesn't create society and association is either an animal or a god right so if a, if a person if if he, if he, if a person does not want to you know engage agni yeah hello could you repeat that i think there was some signal issue at your end i couldn't hear your voice very clearly i don't oh. know if anyone else also had the problem okay okay wait uh, i'll change my network probably uh, it's it's getting disconnected a bit hello 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 uh, am i audible uh i mean I, i could someone else confirm if they're also having this problem yeah it's it's uh, okay yeah, it's not very it's not a very clear connection okay um should i turn off my camera probably yeah maybe try turning your camera off let's see if that makes any difference okay um how is it now am i audible uh barely still oh okay um okay could could you repeat something hello hello check okay. yeah i think it's yeah it's better now oh okay 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 yeah 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 okay yeah okay okay 
So, um, so t uh, till where did you hear me? Uh, um, the, the quote from Aristotle. Yeah, 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 yeah. So for Aristotle, a human that doesn't crave society uh, and association is either an animal or a god, right? So yeah, so this is basically, you know, the end of human beings is to uh, arrange ourselves in, 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 in politically and socially. So anything that forwards that association is in, in harmony with the nature, right? Is in harmony with the nature of human beings. So, so the, the, the idea of natural law, I mean, you know, I mean, Aristotle did not explicitly explicitly talk about natural law. Our understanding of Aristotle's understanding of natural law comes through Thomas Aquinas, uh, Thomas Aquinas and Thomas Aquinas interpretation of Aristotle. So yeah, I, I mean, you know, so that is how it goes. So I, I'll take a quote from Aristotle's ethics, right? Where he says, um, and I quote, there are two sorts of political justice, one natural and other legal. Uh, the natural is that which has the same validity everywhere and does not depend upon ex acceptance. The legal is that which in the first place can take one form or another indifferently, but which once laid down is decisive. That the ransom of, for a prisoner of war shall be one mina, or that goat shall be sacrificed and not to sheep, and also any enactment for particular circumstances such as the sacrifices in honor of Basidas, that was a Spartan general, and decisions made by special resolution. Uh, rules of justice established by convention and on ground of expediency may be compared to standard measures because measures used in wine and corn trades are not e everywhere equal. They are larger and in wholesale and smaller in retail trade. Similarly, laws that are not that are not natural but are man-made are not uniform because forms of government may vary, and but everywhere there is only one natural form of government, namely that which is the best. So, so we sure uh, Aristotle is talking about a sort of a distinction between a sort of a natural law, uh, as in like you know the way that we conceive of it as uh, you know something that facilitates division of humans into society, you know, and, and for for na for Aristotle, the natural law is you know whatever best facilitates this division. But it is to be com contrasted with a law created by humans because you know uh, because law created by humans it, it is it is contingent. You know, every society has its own different needs, and accordingly it arranges itself. So um, for uh, for Aristotle, I mean, I mean, you know, for Aristotle, that is the di difference between natural law and, and, and human law. And it is a definition that is uh, that is adopted by Aquinas, right, when he talks about his theories of four types of law. Now, Aquinas is is uh, he, the Aquinas is popular and it, it, he's a very important thinker because it was through him that, you know, human, I mean, you know, that it was through his idea of human law being grounded in natural or theological reason that, you know, that, that, that human law was able to to have some sort of sanctity, right? So many interpreters of Aquinas say that he threw over positive law, a halo of moral sanctity, right? So, uh, you know why should uh, why should uh, for example why should a, a populace or a nobility accept the rule of a king you know the entire idea of that divine right of a human that divine right of uh, a king you know the, the entire idea just rests from that you know that what what kings are doing they're they're forwarding the will of God by interpreting law and you know, like like uh, like uh, installing laws in a manner that is. Uh, that is congruent to the natural eternal law of that of God, right? So, so that is basically uh, you know Aquinas' uh, contribution. I'll come to the Aquinas theory. Uh, Aquinas, in his uh, work Summa Theologica, talked about four types of laws: eternal law, natural law, human law, and divine law. Now, eternal law is God's eternal plan for the universe, right? It is. In a sense, it is, um, you know, it is not fully knowable because, you know, God works in mysterious ways and whatnot, right? So uh, God's eternal plan for the universe is what is the eternal law. But there is only a small part of it which is discoverable by human reason and that, that is discoverable by human mind. That is what uh, that is what Aquinas calls natural law, right? So natural law is that part of eternal law which is discoverable by reason and is found within the human mind, right? 
uh, and human law on the other hand is the law that is created by humans on the basis of natural reason so taking that natural uh, that natural reason you know trying to use that natural reason to interpret natural law uh, whatever natural law comes out of it we we derive human law from it right so what aquinas says that human law human law that is in in congruence with this natural law it is it is valid and it is law in its purest sense right uh, and other and human laws that are sort of you know that do not conform to natural law are a perversion of law is 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 what basically uh, basically aquinas idea is and divine law is simply uh, you know the law that is revealed uh, to humans by scriptures right so these are the four ideas of law that aquinas has eternal law natural law human law divine law so there is uh, two important takeaways from aquinas theory of of natural law uh, firstly the fact that natural law is discoverable by reason and is inherent in humanity right so it is the participation of the eternal law in rational creature that gives rise to natural law right so this is the first takeaway second takeaway the fact that a human law which contradicts natural law is is not law in its sense, central sense of the term it is a perversion perversion of law as i said okay so these are the basically the two thesis that you know two takeaways from aquinas theory of natural law so these are basically uh, what uh, what we you know refer to as the theological you know ideas of 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 natural law maybe right and it is contrasted with something called the secular natural law which basically you know became popular again in in the 20th century you know basically after the very horrible uh, you know insights that you know that we got from uh, i mean the very horrible incidents that happened during the world war with the you know reign of nazi germany uh, that you know many writers of natural law just you know came up and started theorizing about you know i mean i mean can i mean you know it's does anything become law because it has been put forward by put forward by a sovereign or you know i, I mean is there nothing uh, within the content of law that should that should you know determine what law actually is right you know that there, there should be some sort of principles that that are inherent in the idea of law that should determine what law is that comes after uh, you know second world war the thinkers like lon fullert john finnes will come to it when we when we when we are talking about law you know legal philosophy of 20th century for now um, we are done with our uh, part of natural law will come to come to natural law again later so uh, natural law i mean this is the basic idea that you know uh, that that is propounded now uh, i i'd like to take a short break and then we'll start talking about the philosophy of common law so yeah uh, any questions any observations comments anything uh okay um if there are not any um i will uh, yeah jump on to a discussion about uh, common law okay so i'll give you a context of what we mean by common law before we begin into the philosophy of common law so um today i mean the two basically you know something that there are two basically two broad legal cultures right Uh, legal cultures in the sense that you know the way that we practice law the way that we look upon law there are two main legal cultures that exist in 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 the world today one is the civil law culture the other is the common law culture so common law culture is is followed by uh, followed by uh, followed by countries and jurisdictions that had the influence of english law with them so you know so of course the laws of england follow common law laws of united states laws of india laws of uh, of uh, australia new zealand all these countries which were you know that which which were under the british rule in the they they usually follow the common law system and other countries basically you know countries from continental europe or other countries which were um, you know and either the influence of uh, of uh, of for you know continental europe and other countries like japan uh countries like you know uh, germany all these countries follow a civil law system right so what is the basic difference i mean you know both of them have different origins you know in the in the sense that uh, civil law follows a lineage from roman law 
and you know and and it sort of looks to roman law as its predecessor um common law on the other hand it it's derived from common law practices of medieval and you know uh, medieval england right and you know how law developed in england at that time so so the basic difference i mean you know the the, the difference between uh, the civil law and natural law cultures in today's time has very much diminished the the only the only i mean prominent features that you know that distinguishes civil law from common law is through our it is the system of precedence that we follow in common law right so what is the system of precedent it is that you know what has you know if if a higher court is basically you know tells that you know something uh, something is done in, 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 in you know something does something the lower courts have you know have the obligation to do exactly the same right i mean in 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 similar cases we we decide similarly that is what the doctrine of precedent says and a precedent is you know and and a precedent as it exhibits today uh, a, a higher court can you know ignore the precedent and and you know deem that a precedent adopted in a previous case was wrong but the, the lower court does not have that option right so lower court for example lower uh, district courts are bound by the precedent set by high courts and supreme courts uh, high courts and supreme high courts are you know bound by the precedent set by larger benches of high courts and 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 supreme courts and supreme court is bound by you know decisions of larger benches of 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 supreme court right so for example a, a, a bench which has only two judges is bound by a decision taken by uh, taken by a, a bench of judges which had four judges for example five judges for example right so 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 this is how basically the system of precedent works in our country uh and and also um, i mean you know and apart from this you know the distinction that you know a superior court should you know follow um follow its inferior inferior courts uh, inferior court should follow superior court judgment and 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 common law we also have you know that the fact that you know if for example two courts of equal competence you know they have taken a decision they should ideally you know stick to it they don't have a legal obligation to but you know they should stick to its previous decision and if there is a conflict between you know two uh, for example two two division benches and or you know two two judge benches give a decision that is in conflict with each other it is to be sorted by uh, a, 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 a superior court or a bench with higher judges right so this is basically the idea uh, the system of precedent that we have in common uh, common law which does not exist in civil law civil law is basically you know works through system of courts right i, I mean you know uh, you you take decisions from from the courts and you know the decisions taken do not have any relevance apart from the factual matrix of the case right there are there is no system of precedent so to speak that you know that that is binding upon in, in civil law jurisdiction so the law that we usually study in in our law schools is common law uh, and civil law is you know studied in 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 jurisdiction where civil law is a thing now when we're talking about the philosophy of common law we're talking about the philosophy of the system of precedents that are taken as law right so um and 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 the modern practice of common law should not be confused with when we talk about the common law of england as a system of laws that you know were, were practiced then they are very different because you know the way that law functions today is you know we have a lot of positive law a lot of you know laws enacted as codes right and and it is through the interpretation of you know uh, it, it is a, it is a feature of you know which has traditionally been a feature of civil law now it has entered uh, you know uh, common law in in the sense that you know now now we have basically in, in both civil law and common law jurisdictions we have this mix match of you know civil law traditions common law traditions taking place so but in but in common law england there were they, they, the law was largely uh, you know it was largely unwritten or lex non scripta as you know we say uh, law that is not written so so in that cases what used to happen is that judges used to decide laws uh based on a system of precedents right they you know cases that had you know that had examined a particular point of law previously you know we 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 take similar decisions in the future right so uh, and even today i mean a large portion of england's laws are unwritten you know britain's laws are unwritten they 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 work through common laws right uh, laws of uh, contracts for example laws of criminal uh, criminal law are largely unwritten still in in, in england uh but you know there are of course you know a lot of codification that has taken place in india i think a legacy of common law we can observe is the fact that the law of torts you know a law of civil remedy you know is they're not codified right so 
uh, provisions like for example um, you know uh, trespass uh, provisions dealing with assault battery and all these things uh, where you can sue other party and you know laws of negligence all these are tort laws in india they are not codified even though laws of contract and laws of crime are 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 codified so it is a, a, another legacy of common law that we observe in in modern jurisprudence right uh, so uh, yeah so when we are talking about common law in 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 this context we are talking about the common laws of england when we are talking about the philosophy of common law we are talking about the philosophy of common laws of england right and uh, you know some various key thinkers like william hale uh, edward coke and lord blackstone you know were important uh, yeah, important a uh, theorist so to speak they're not exactly theorists they were jurists you know jurists who basically propounded uh, you know i are you know explain the ideas of common laws of england so um so common law theory reasserted the medieval idea that uh, law is not something that is made either by the king or the parliament or judges but it is uh, the expression of a deeper reality which is uh, which is nearly is discovered or publicly declared by them right but it is different from natural law i'll explain why uh because the entire idea that you know the common law rests on is the idea that uh that what what common law seeks to decipher or seeks to put forward is the law that is that is customary you know that the law that has been followed since time immemorial in in england you know that becomes the law uh, that is this that is this merely declared by judges so judges are not in the sense they're not creating laws when they are they're declaring new doctrines what they're doing is that they're interpreting the customary law of england that law that has developed through customs in england and they're merely interpreting it you know as as impartial uh, impartial and objective you know students of law rather than you know just imparting their own ideas of law so this entire idea that you know laws that judges should uh, you know but judges should not create law they should you know just impartially without any political uh, influence or any any ideological influence they should objectively study and 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 you know they should derive the law that is what that is something that comes with the with the with the ayat with the philosophy of common law so and you know the fact that you know we should do what has been done before and we should take a system of precedent that is also called the doctrine of stare decisis in law uh so uh, so yeah so basically what 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 uh, common law does is that it says that you know judges should not uh, you know judges should merely study the customary and the customary law that has existed in england since time immemorial and, and time immemorial and should come up with the law through this right so um william hill believed that customary law is not law because it has been enacted by an authority or power to do so but it is but you know what gives it the force of law is the fact that it is it is time tested and you know and the basic reason behind you know adoption of common law is that it has existed in custom for many many years since time immemorial and uh, and you know the basic idea is that it could not have lasted so long if it was not reasonable so there is this maxim called via treata via truta a via truta which it says that the trodden road is safe what it basically means to imply is that uh, that you know the basic idea is that you know if 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 you're passing through a forest right and uh, you know there is one route that you know that travelers keep keep you know going through going through, you know keep making the thoroughfare through it and then one one road is like you know this new not discovered at all so you would place your trust in the road that you know people have you know been frequenting because you know uh, people came out in one piece through that road so you know there's a fat chance that you know it is a safe road and you know i should i should go through that so this is the basic idea behind uh, behind common law you know for having custom as 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 laws uh, so and i'll i'll, I'll try to I, i'll quote something from sir john davies who was a very influential theorist and uh, i'll quote something that he said in his irish report of 1612 and i quote 
uh, for custom taketh beginning and groweth to perfection in this manner when a reasonable act done is found to be good and beneficial to people and agreeable to their nature and disposition then then do they use it and practice it again and again and so, and so by often iteration and multiplication of the act it becometh a custom and being continued without interruption time out of mind it obtaineth the force of law and this customary law is most perfect and most excellent and without comparison the best to make and preserve a commonwealth for written laws which are made either by the edicts of prince or by councils of estates are imposed upon the subjects before any trial or probation made whether the same be fit and agreeable to the nature and the disposition of the people or whether they will breed any convenience or no but a custom doth never become a law to bind pe- bind the people until it had been tried and approved out of mind during all which there did arise no inconvenience for it would had been incon- for uh, if it had been found inconvenient at any time it would it, it had been used no longer and would have been interrupted and constant and consequently it had lost the virtue of a force of law end quote so what basically it is talking about is, is that you know why why ka the law of custom or common law is superior to law made by a sovereign or law that is posited by human beings is that you know we can come up with anything but how you know how do we know that it is agreeable to the disposition of people whether you know it will suit people or whether it will work or not how will we know that we cannot know that so customs is superior because it is time tested and that is something that gives custom the force of law that is something that gives common law the force of the law so uh, in a sense it is the collective wisdom of people who have meditated on law for you know long people who are educated in law who have meditated on the notions of law that are you know coming up with these doctrines that are inherent in the customary law of england right so um an uh, interesting thing um, you know ronald bards you know, many centuries later after you know uh, uh, you know after you know common law has been conceived uh in 20th century we'll talk about how the author you know ha- was an invention of the enlightenment and western individualism and has not always enjoyed a position of authority right so um Lo- bards famously declared that it is the language that speaks and not the author so you look at these medieval customs of uh, of common law you'll see that you know it is not the individual judges that have any importance here it is not the sovereign which has the importance here but rather the 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 custom or you know this this uh, im impersonal body of laws that is developed historically that is what is important here and we will see a subversion of this trope with enlightenment where you know the positive law the creator of law the sovereign or the judge takes the primary role but that you know we'll come to that later uh so so w- w- what we are talking about when you're talking about common law is a law that is that has been you know that has that is customary it is not propounded by single individual it has the force of history behind it it is time tested and that is why it has the force of law uh so yeah uh, the basic idea is that the single person cannot measure up to the collective wisdom that has gathered over the ages and that is why a customary law is superior um so um coke uh, in in the bonham case you know uh, and you know this is this is the idea also that this is also where the idea of judicial review comes in right so uh, the the idea that um, you know for example today the idea of judicial review exists in 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 the fact that you know if if uh, if a law made by inferior body if it you know interferes with the law made by superior body it can be struck down for example uh, an executive order passed by passed by uh, an executive department can be struck down if it is not in accordance to uh, a, a statutory law right for example the rules of uh, of consumer protection act can be struck down by if it if they're not in accordance to the consumer protection act that is passed by the parliament right so in a similar way a, a statutory law can be struck down if it is not in consonance with the constitutional law which is a higher law to statutory law right so if there is a provision passed by a uh, provision passed in, passed into law by the parliament this is not an agreeable in agree in agreement to the constitution it can be struck down right so for example if a law violates the uh, fundamental guarantees of constitution of equality of life and liberty it can be struck down so this is the idea of judicial review as it existed in 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 in, in modern jurisprudence but where does it come from it 
comes from this idea that you know that there is this historical law or common law that is superior to a law that 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 is that is common law right so a uh, superior to uh, a law that exists um out there you know that that's sorry a, a law that exists uh, that that is exists because it has been posited by people because it is not time tested so in, in, it is in a sense inferior to the law that is customary law that has been passed by you know passed by the decade so uh, so sir sir uh, sir uh, edward coke uh, who was a famous english jurist in a case uh, called bonum versus the college of uh, bonum versus the college of physicians uh, talked about uh, talked about this it this idea of judicial review so this case dealt with uh, with an individual called uh, dr bonum uh, this was decided in 1610 by the court of common pleas in england under sir edward coke who was the chief justice at this time so in this case it was ruled that dr bonum has been wrongly imprisoned by the college of physicians for practicing medicine without a license right so in the bonum case uh, coke made it clear that that, uh, that you know that he considered the common law to be superior to the acts of the parliament uh, and i quote and it I, I'm, i'm quoting directly from uh, the the bonum case judgment and it appears quote and it appears in our books that in many cases the common law will control the acts of parliament and sometimes adjudge them to be utterly void for when an for when an act of parliament is against the common right and reason or repugnant or impossible to be performed the common law will control it and adjudge such an act to be void so yeah this is the doctrine of uh, judicial review as it came from uh, from uh, the uh, the idea that that you know customary law and common law superior um kok also talks about the distinction between artificial and natural reason as we touched upon right when talking about natural uh, law we talked about how you know uh, cicero cicero and you know quinus thought that you know it is law that is derived from natural reason right but kok and you know many other uh, uh, law, many other philosophers in the common law tradition on the other hand believed uh, believed it to be uh, to be a product that that comes through um, uh, you know it it comes through a, a set of a legal reasoning right or something that is artificial reasoning as opposed to uh, common reasoning right so uh, so what basically is this artificial reason artificial reason is something you know that has acquired by judges through uh, study uh, through the study of the common laws of england you know uh, study of precedents as they have observed that as they have been observed over time and that they have uh, and that has you know that they have emerged through uh, through various ages right so so that is what the artificial legal reasoning you know artificial reason comes from a legal reasoning that comes through the study of law and you know that is separate from natural reasoning so uh, so edward coke talks about how if we use our natural reason to come up with uh, you know ideas about law there will there will obviously you know be various different conception of what is uh, what is reasonable and there will be multiplicity of conflicting views right uh so what what we do in order to quell this you know multiplicity of views that uh, arises through natural reason every person you know naturally reasoning reasoning uh, what what we do is that you know we we supplant this natural reason with an artificial reason that comes through the study of law where where from law emerges right so um uh so the uh so the view, okay so um i will uh, quote uh, uh i'll quote coke uh, edward coke uh, from his 12th report uh, and i quote a controversy of land between parties was heard by the king and sentence given which was repealed for this that it did not belong to common law then the king said that he, that he thought the law was founded upon reason and that he like others had reason as well as the judges to which it was answered by me that true it was that god had endowed his majesty with the excellent science and great endowments of nature 
but his majesty was not learned in the laws of the realm of england and causes which concern the life inheritance or goods or fortunes of his subjects are not this not to be decided by natural law reason but by artificial reason and judgment of law which law is an act which requires long study and experience before the ma- that before that a man can attain to cognizance of it and that law was the golden met van and measure uh, and measure to try the causes of the subjects and which protected his majesty in safety and peace with which the king was greatly offended and said then then he should be under the law which was treason to affirm as he said to which i said and bratton saith quod rex non debet esse sub homin sed sub dio et lege which means that 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 king is under no man but under god and the law so this idea that we you know we today associate with the rule of law you know comes from this idea that you know law is superior to to you know the the king you know so the king is only under the god and the law uh, you know the the idea of you know more rule of law as exist in 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 modern jurisprudence it concerns itself with you know some idea about law that you know that anything cannot be law it should it should be you know uh, it should it should have certain properties to attach to it for it to be considered law it's considered to be the rule of law you know not any person can you know on his whim on their whims and fancy you know posit anything to be law right there should be uh, should be a rule of law that is superior to any any individual person's whims and fancies so this idea of rule of law also emerges from this idea of common you know our philosophy of common law but of course uh, you know uh, with uh, and you know I'll, I'll talk about the difference between uh, the ideas of coke and hail i think yeah uh, so before that I'll, i'll i'll talk about some ideas that hail propounded uh, with respect to common law um, before that i think i think let's talk about the the debate between thomas hobbes and 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 the edward coke so thomas hobbes as we all know was a materialist philosopher he gave a, the theory of a law as something that is uh, that is you know uh, that arises as, as through a contract between people and the sovereign right so in a sense what hobbes hobbes was giving was something akin to a positivist theory of law right and it's important to uh, to note that this the debate between coke and hobbes coke and hobbes also denotes a sort of a debate between um, you know the 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 conservative common law tradition and the enlightenment you know liberal reason right so we see and and i'll quote and i'll quote something that uh, the, from a text written by thomas hobbes it was it is called the di- it is called a dialogue between a philosopher and a student of common laws of england so i'll quote and you know try to explain where what is it that you know hobbes is getting at and what is uh, hobbes objection to the common law uh, philosophy right so um so in this dialogue between a philosopher and a student of common laws of england the lawyer says this is to be understood of an artificial perfection of reason gotten by long study observation experience and not every man's natural reason for nemo nar- nascitur artifex or that no man is born an artisan right so the legal reason is summa ratio or the supreme reason and therefore if all the reason that is dispersed into so many several heads were united into one yet could not make such a law as the common as the law of england because by so many succession of ages it had been fine and refined by an infinite number of grave and learned men so in response to that uh, the philosopher says that that reason which is life of law should not be natural but artificial i cannot conceive i understand well that the knowledge of law is gotten by a study as all other sciences which when they studied and obtained it is done by natural and not artificial reason i grant you that the knowledge of law is an art but not that any art of one man or of many wise uh, or of many how wise soever the of many men how wise soever they may be or the work of one or many artificers how perfect soever it be is law it is not wisdom but authority that makes law obscure also are the words of legal reason there is a reason in earthly creatures but humane reason but i suppose that he that is coke means that 
reason of a judge or of all the judges together without the king is that summa ratio and very law which i deny because none can make law but that he hath the legislative power and that law hath been find uh, find by grave and learned men meaning the professors of law is manifestly untrue for all the laws of england have been made by the kings of england consulting with the nobility and commons and of which not one of 20 was a learned lawyer the lawyer say, and the lawyer replies to that you speak of the statute law i speak of the common law to which the philosopher says i speak of law generally so what what hobbes is doing here is he's trying to negate a difference between a common law and a statute law right that all law in a sense is 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 posited by by uh, you know by the king because it is the king you know who appoints the judges to basically enforce this uh, this common law so it is in no manner that this law is superior to the king so to speak now in this uh, in this uh, dialogue we also another important observation to make is that we see the importance of the author of the law coming into the picture right uh, the author as a rational agent who can grasp the truth to their own reason which is a very enlightenment esque idea of 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 law and reason right so the so the enlightenment you know talked about how we can you know all of us are reasonable principle and reasonable subjects and you know we can grasp the truth only if we can you know reason correctly so that is a view that has been forwarded by hobbes in this dialogue between hobbes and coke right uh um ha huh. uh so so uh also thobes in his leviathan talks about his his own idea of law right so 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 how does law hope sort of you know talk about how do we differentiate okay so the problem with natural reason is that if every person is reasoning naturally what happens is that we have a multiplicity of what natural law can you know what 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 law can be denoted by 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 natural reason how do we sort of solve this issue uh, you know how do we solve this issue to that the answer that uh, that hobbes gives is that we appoint a sovereign you know whose own subjective understanding of law is not any more refined by the individual is not any more refined than individual people but the advantage that sovereign has is that the sovereign can enforce has the power to enforce you know the law so so whatever the sovereign says becomes the law in that manner it is not superior but at the same time it is uniform uh so that is basically the idea that you know the idea that you know hobbes is forwarding as a challenge to common law um this uh, view i mean you know that, you know in addition to you know, this is of course the debate that's talking about that's taking place between uh between uh, hobbes and 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 coke right but there is an another like you know view posited by uh, by hale with regard to uh with regard to what common law is supposed to be so he argues that the history of common law of england uh you know uh there is no sensible talk about that we cannot talk about the origins of national of common law so to speak uh, he argued that human reason cannot be much use of construction of a universally acceptable system of laws and that is because they cannot be mathematically deduced and all, always you know uh lead to multiplicity of different opinions as, as has been already been stated so hale's view you know f- you know in a way from the cornerstone of co- conservative politics today he argued that the role of law is to bring certainty and stability to the government even though if the price to be paid for this certainty in many uh, in many cases is uh, you know injustice in particular instances so the test of the test of long experience should be preferred over new theories because you know the the old you know the idea of common law you know tested law it brings stability uh to to uh, to you know system but because we do not know where and how you know the natural how uh how new the, the the laws passed by the parliament or the princes how how the public will react to it so new theories you know should be rejected in 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 favor of long experience it's the it's a view that you know hale is trying to purport so um so hale and you know so then how about how do we conceive the idea of legal change if you know we have to stick to old traditions 
to to look to change you know not new theories so hail like and many other conservative thinkers believe that change is an incremental process rather than a that's then something that is uh, imposed by a system of arbitrarily enforced laws right theories are often removed from reality in which they operate but you know common law has the advantage of being developed through application of act in actual material cases so legal reasoning then based on precedent in this manner works to preserve existing legal structures and you know coke's uh, coke and hale's attitude towards the past i'll i'll just take a take something take uh, some time to um to you know we have seen you know the coke's and hale's idea of of common law where they converge there are certain certain points of differences between coke and hale's idea of 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 uh, of common law right so while coke believed that you know uh coke's idea of common law is that you know that law has been same through uh you know time time immemorial uh and uh, for 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 all the practical purposes by the way whenever uh, you know that any law of england refers to time immemorial it refers to the reign you know to to the reign of king richard the 1st you know who was installed in 1189 so for all practical purposes you know anything that happened before that is before memory and anything that happened after that is after memory you know the time immemorial becomes you know the reign of richard iii 1189 uh, ad right uh, so but when we talking about coke you know when he talked about law as something that is you know that exists through time immemorial and you know, that is only discovered the law that you know that that the uh, that exists in the common law of england what he's talking about is that you know so how do we conceive the idea of change for example so when coke talks about the idea of legal change he either says that you know a change can either be a derogation of the law or it can be a, a corrective process right so there is an idea of of you know what is the customary natural you know customary uh, law and you know i you can either you know move towards it or or you can move away from it right so 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 the good judgments what they do is that they move more and more towards that customary ideal of law and bad judgments they derogate from that ideal of law heel on the other hand believed uh, you know he gave the example of the ship of theseus right which was a ship you know the the ship of argonauts as, as it was called it was a ship that you know that that when it left port you know and by the time that it reached the port again you know every part of it was changed in a manner that it did not have any material of 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 the original boat right but but it ha- but it was still in 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 some senses the same boat you know philosophers try to trick each other by saying that you know by asking questions that can we step into the same river twice because you know the material of the ship has changed but you know the form of it uh, it has remained the same so basically the question about where does identity lie so hail uh, you know says that the ship of theseus is an example how the common law functions right it is through you know it is uh, you know the the various parts of the ship are being continually changed uh, in the sense that you know we 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 are replacing continuously various parts of the ship we are con- replacing many doctrines of common law here and there but it does not mean that you know it it is not the same common law as it was when it began right what we are observing here is that the ship of theseus you know all the materials have changed the form has not changed uh, and there is there is a very you know uh, a very good observation we can ch- take uh, from the idea coke's idea of of uh, of uh, what law is supposed to be and what hale's idea of law is supposed to be through the ideas of plato and aristotle right so plato conceived of uh, Uh, plato conceived of you know the the way we find out the identity of things is that you know there is an transcendental identity of ev- every concept every idea whether it beauty whether it be justice that exists out there in the world right so so all all you know so for anything to assess whether something is just or beautiful we need to see how much it conforms with the with the with the idea the transcendent idea of 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 you know of that of the form Right. The same way, you know, you can look at the parallels between, you know, Plato's idea of forms and Coke's idea of law. So, you know, the same way, you know, a thing is just or unjust. Comp- you know, looking at how how much it conforms to or derogates from the transcendent idea of justice. For Coke, the common law is uh, is law. You know, is closer to the idea. Is it's more of more and more of itself as it's closely sort of resembles the 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 law as it was through time immemorial, right? Which is like, I mean, what what is time immemorial? Some transcendent concept of law, right? 
so so uh, so this is basically the idea that coke sort of talked about and hale's idea is it's more you know refers to aristotle's theory of hylomorphism uh, for hylomorphism i explain what hylomorphism is uh, is that okay so when we so um atomism uh, was an idea that was propounded by greek thinker uh, democritus and was later perfected by uh, epicurus and 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 lucretius so what what basically atomism says that all that exists is matter right and all the cha- all all the ideas of identity and all the ideas of difference all the identity of change should be uh, you know uh, should be explained this with this you know uh with this uh with this idea of matter right so you know and you know democritus idea is like you know there must be a point at which you know we divide the world that you know the smallest particle that remains is the atom right so so uh, any change that occurs is through you know is through the change within this atomic configuration it, that was the theory of I- atomism right but at the on the other hand the aristotle's theory of hylomorphism stated that um it is not just uh, you know that identity of a thing lies in 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 the matter of a thing it is also lies in you know the identity of thing primarily lies in the form of the thing right we talked about when we talking about aristotle the material cause and the formal cause of things right so uh, so uh, so to ex- to explain uh, you know uh, aristotle's theory of change he talked about the idea of hylomorphism right you know that I, that, that the, the thing is both what it is constituted of its matter and its form so for aristotle the identity of the thing you know that is what a thing is it lies in its its form rather than its matter right its matter can change but as long as its form remains the same it is that thing so for example the ship of theseus you know uh it the form of the ship has remained same throughout the journey it doesn't matter if the matter of it has changed over the course of 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 you know the journey that the since the form is the same then we can say it is it is the same ship can we step in the same river twice yes we can because you know even though the matter of it is that is water is constantly changing the form of the ship remains the same that is i or sort of idea of hylomorphism and when we talk about uh, aristotle i mean you know hegel's idea of uh, of co- of common law it is similar to i i sort of the idea of hylomorphism in the sense that you know it is through you know the passage of time you know the matter of it that the doctrines or whatever the law has it changes but the form of it is sort of main same so it is in the sense the same common law so that is the difference between the ideas of uh, of cook and hale um and yeah so the the way that you know uh, the the the, thing, the common law has changed has of course so uh, Uh, i think uh, we we just uh, we 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 about when so i i'll take uh, uh, you know some time to talk about the critiques of common law that you know many enlightenment thinkers had before i i i you know before we end this today session so this is basically we we talked about how common law uh, you know works today and uh, and you know there are many critiques that people had uh, of of this idea of common law uh one of you know i mean critique one of the stringent critique in literature we find in in jonathan swift's work uh uh, uh of uh, yeah 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 okay uh we will we'll, I'll, i'll just end with this idea uh, i'll just end with this two ideas uh, of of you know not to take much of your time since we are running out of time uh we'll we'll we'll, we'll just end with the uh, gulliver's criticism and and you know bentham's criticism of these ideas of common law uh so you know uh i'm quoting this from gulliver's travel chapter 5 uh it is a maxim among these lawyers that whatever has been done before may legally be done again and therefore they take special care to record all decisions formally made against the common justice and general reason of mankind these under the name of precedents they re- they produce as authorities to justify the most iniquitous opinions and the judges never fail directing accordingly so this entire idea of precedence was of course came into heavy criticism uh with uh, jonathan swift and, and of course uh, jeremy bentham was one of the most stringent critics of of of, uh, of common law right so he talks about common law and its doctrines as you know as something that perpetuates uh, a system of precedence as something that perpetuates unjust legal doctrines just to float around just because you know they have been they have been decided so in the past uh so so bentham this is what bentham call you know bentham calls common law dog law in very caustic terms right so um this is what bentham writes uh when your dog does anything you want uh you know i mean i'll just give an example i mean you know he's he's what he's doing he's criticizing the retrospectivity of law 
right rest retrospectivity of common law because you know it is only after a case comes to the court that you know that that the judges decide whether something is the law or not right so what it is doing is that you know benson is trying to point out that it is not you know enabling the rational uh, guiding guidance of human conduct you know we we talked about fuller's criticism of you know nazi law you know when we began right is that you know if if law cannot guide reasonable human reasonable people's conduct you know is it even law so he he called it not the law of humans but the law of dogs and i quote when your dog does anything you want to break him off you wait till he does it and then beat him for it this is the way you make laws for your dogs and this is the way the judges make laws for you and me they won't tell a man beforehand what is it is it is that he should do they lie uh, they lie by till uh, he has done something which they say he should not have done and then hang him for it and further ex post facto law is an abomination ex post facto law is like you know retrospective law is an is is an abomination interwoven in the very essence of that spurious and impostor substitute which to its makers and its dupes is the object of such prostrate ad- admiration and such indefatigable eulogy and under the name of common or unwritten law Uh, assuming that the declaratory theory is not supportable the logical conclusion is indeed that the common law method is inherently retrospective if judges make law and in the same instance apply it to uh, to in two cases before them they are in effect determining the retrospectivity or by uh, the retrospectively the legal relationship between parties yet such retrospectivity is arguably unavoidable in any case even statutes require interpretation in that sense Uh, their effect can never be determined in advance so what bentham is like you know directing us is towards a positivist understanding of law as in you know it should be something that has been posited by humans before so it can guide human conduct accordingly and you know the the and bentham's influence in in law had a very deep impact in the you know how law was shaped throughout the world right uh, i mean uh it was you know lord macaulay was heavily influenced by bentham's idea and that is why probably we have the indian penal code and the contracts law written in in code today because you know bentham basically influenced a lot of people and you know bentham's in, the people who were influenced by bentham they basically came went to various places and you know in british colonies and in and encoded the law rather than you know working on law through you know the way that it with the common law worked in england uh, bentham also wrote to james madison you know in 1811 who was the president of 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 america that you know that most of that you know appealing to him that you know we should have law and courts uh, rather than you know working by common law because it is only through this that we can avoid the the idea of uh, of retrospectivity and you know uh, so i will like to end here and uh, tomorrow we'll 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 talk about how the idea bentham's ideas influenced you know uh, the start of a positivist tradition in law i will talk about how the one of the first uh, conclu- you know uh, first con- first comprehensive theories of positive legal positivism was laid by uh, austin and how he was influenced by bentham in doing so we will also talk about the positive law theories of kelsen and h l a hart uh and then we'll get into 20th century uh, legal philosophy and you know we'll we'll see how the debate between you know natural law you know the new emerging fields of natural law was interacting with positive law how it was interacting with uh, you know legal interpretivism which is uh, which is another school that we haven't talked about which is sort of you know emerges from common law but is very different from it we'll talk about that tomorrow we'll also talk about how you know the critical and postmodern theories have criticized these conventional approaches towards law um so yeah uh, thank you for uh, tuning tuning in today um i'll stop the recording now and yeah i'll i'll probably see you tomorrow um around the same time uh, we'll talk about uh, yeah we'll talk about uh, uh the rest of uh, what we are supposed to talk about <laughs> uh okay thank you sir i think that will be about it thank you so much a bit a bit too no, long, no, a bit no, too no. long. though these these things that they happen all the time all good uh thank you so much that was remarkably encyclopedic um i'm looking forward to hearing from you tomorrow ah thank you thank you uh, i'll probably uh, okay so I, i'll 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 uh, upload the recording on on youtube probably and you know share it uh, so if anyone wants to attend to this lecture and you know uh, they can sure. do it and yeah so if they're not able to attend it so i'll just do it right now okay Sure thing. All right. Okay. 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 Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Bye.
थैंक यू सारा